Okay, so this is where we left off in class. Um, we were just finishing talking about soft bottom communities and we talked about the food chains and all of that stuff. So um, now we're just going to talk about succession in soft bottom communities and basically what happens in, is that like landslides or waves or something can cause um, disturbance of the sediments. Um, and so basically a bunch of animals are carried away or killed um, and the top layer of soil is also gone um, for whatever reason. And so what is exposed are these deeper layers of dirt. Um, and the deeper layers of dirt are what we call anoxic, meaning without oxygen. And because they're anoxic, you actually don't have um, animals that can survive there um, because they are anoxic. Um, and so you need some sort of creature to come and settle there and like kind of allow water to circulate through there and so that oxygen can get there and you can actually have um, animals that can recolonize that area. And so basically you have little larvae of like worms and stuff like that that come and they will recolonize the anoxic sediments and then you get things like polychaete worms um, that will come and feed on organic material and burrow through the dirt and start to aerate the sediments meaning they poke holes in it and um, then water can circulate through and oxygen can get in there and then once the oxygen is able to travel through um, then other animals can start to come and so we call that succession because basically it, there's a succession of animals that can um, recolonize an area after it's been disturbed so that's succession. Okay, so hard bottom subtitle communities. Um, these are just really a small portion of the continental shelf. You don't find these that often. It's typically a soft bottom community. Um, and typically when you do find these, they're just like rocky shores that are submerged. Um, and so they're, they're just an extension into the subtitle zone of the intertidal zone. Um, you can have rocks, but in some, cases you can actually have like oyster shells or calcareous algae or tubes of polychaete worms that will form the hard surface for things to attach to. So the, in the temperate regions in a, a hard bottom community you will find a kelp forest. This is like what a kelp forest look, lo looks like, just a picture to give you an idea of what we're actually going to be talking about. Okay, so you find kelp forests only in temperate and polar regions. They need the water to be less than 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. So remember when we talked about coral reefs, we said they have to be warmer than 20 degrees Celsius. Okay, well, their coral reefs for that reason are only found in the tropics. Kelp need to be less than 20 to 25 degrees Celsius, so they are not found in the tropics. And so everywhere that's colored that you can see, um, that would be like the, where you would find a kelp forest, okay? So worldwide, that's where you find them. So kelp communities, the main thing that obviously makes up a kelp community is the kelp. That's the basis for everything that's there. And kelp is just a large brown seaweed. And depending on where you are in the world, you can have different kinds of these kelp. If you're in the North Atlantic or in the Asiatic area, um, your main type of kelp that will form kelp communities are laminara, um, and then the Pacific coast of North and South America, it's macrocystis, which is the giant kelp. And I'll show you pictures of the two so you can see the difference between them. So this is laminaria, and this is macrocystis. So you can see the two different types of kelp will obviously be able to have different types of animals because this one on the left right here, the laminaria, notice how dense it is, whereas compared to the macrocystis on the right, um, much less dense. So you have more things living in the water column here than you would here. Okay, requirements that kelp need to grow. They need rocks or, or for, for them to attach to. So even if they're surrounded by sand, is that you've got a rock in the middle of a bunch of sand, that kelp can attach to that rock. Um, so they just need some sort of hard surface to attach to. They need cold waters and they need a lot of nutrients. Kelp can grow very, very quickly. Macrocystis can grow two feet a day. So they need lots of nutrients um, in order to be able to grow that fast. So nutrient rich cold water with a hard surface to attach to. That's what they need. 
So in a kelp forest, if you have all of those requirements, kelp will grow. Um, and kelp will form different habitats in a kelp forest. So just like the rainforest, you have like the canopy and the understory, same thing for a kelp forest. So up here at the top, okay, where the algae kind of grows and then um, then it actually, once it reaches the surface, it keeps growing along the surface and just kind of like floats on the top. Um, that creates the canopy. So you've got lots of different things that will live up there. And then here at the bottom, okay, that's the understory. And on in the understory, you can have different types of things that will grow. So you can have short algae. If you've got just a rocky shore, you'll have shorter algae that will grow down here. But if you've got like rocks with um, uh, sandy areas around it, then you'll have seagrass that will surround that. Or it'll look something like this picture on the left. So that's that's what it'll look like. You've got the canopy and the understory. So even different parts of the kelp will harbor different animals. So the holdfast at the bottom, if you remember, that's the anchor of the kelp, you'll have tons and tons of creatures that will live inside that holdfast. In fact, a holdfast of a kelp could be huge um, because they've got to hold on so tightly and it hopefully won't get washed away. Um, but you'll have things like brittle stars and crabs and worms and isopods that will actually burrow into like, and live inside the holdfast of the kelp. And then on the rocks that surround that, you'll have all sorts of sea stars, sea urchins, sponges, tunicates, snails, limpets, sea anemones, abalone, lobster, sea slugs, and crabs. So just lots of different types of things. And then you actually get things that live on the algae itself. And those things are called epiphytes. So you have things like bryozoans, um, and kelp crabs, the kelp limpet, and top snails. So you'll get all sorts of things that will actually live on the kelp itself. And then if you have sand flats that are around the kelp beds and the rocks, you'll get all sorts of fish, as well as tube anemones, snails, and clams that will live there. So different types of animals will live on different parts of the kelp. Here's just some pictures to show you. So you have get like the, the kelp crab here, okay, and kelp limpet, and this shows you the bryozoans that live on the surface. Those are all epiphytes. Okay, and then like sea stars, this is in the holdfast. Okay, um, and brittle stars and stuff that will live in the holdfast of the kelp. Okay, in the water column in a kelp forest, you will actually have fish and mammals that will live there. Um, you don't really have a lot of birds because birds will get caught in the kelp and it's really hard to get under the kelp and so they have to come back up to the surface to breathe and so they don't really dive underneath the, the surface of the kelp because they get caught and they would die. Um, but you do get like harbor seals and sea otters and stuff that will dive down into the water and they don't have a problem getting back up. Um, and then these are just different types of fish that you will see. So you've got the blacksmith. The Garibaldi is very, very common. That's the California state fish. California sheep's head. China rockfish. Okay, those are the types of things that you'll find. Um, birds will sit on the surface of the kelp and pick things off that are up at the surface, but they rarely dive underneath the canopy. Okay, why kelp forests matter? Um, number one, they are a diverse habitat. Um, you get lots and lots of animals that live here because there are lots and lots of places to live. Um, they can live on the kelp, in the holdfast, in the canopy, in the water column, surrounding the rocks that the algae attach to, just lots of places to live. So lots of different creatures are found here. They also help to protect the coast from waves because the kelp actually slows down the waves um, before they reach the shore and so they help to dissipate some of the wave energy. And they also provide protection for lots of different types of animals. So even gray whales will use kelp forests for protection. Um, they will swim on one side of the kelp forest, like closer to the shore, um, and orcas don't normally do that and so they find protection um, from orcas by swimming on the other side of kelp forests because orcas like to eat baby gray whales. Um, and then we also have a lot of commercial value that we'll get from kelp. So um, algin and potash and carrageenan and lots of different things will come from kelp. Um, those are things that we can extract from kelp. And then we get also get lots of commercial species that live in kelp forests. So urchins, um, if you like to eat uni, Okay, those urchins love kelp forests. Um, you also get lots of lobster and fish that will live in kelp forests as well. And then tourism, 
It's really fun to dive and also to kayak in a kelp forest because there's so much to see. Um, and there's also lots of wildlife watchers that will go and do those things for that reason because you can see lots of different cool things. Okay, so El Nino. El Nino can actually be a problem for a kelp forest and, and here's why. So typically at the equator you have really, really strong winds and what happens is those strong winds push warm water at the surface um, towards the western Pacific over by like Indo the Indo-Pacific, Australia, Indonesia, over there. Um, and you ha and because of that you actually have upwelling of cold water by Peru. Um, but in El Nino, those winds that typically are very, very constant, they weaken. And so what happens is some of that warm water actually comes back across the Pacific and you get um, warm water over by Peru. Um, and so, and then that warm water starts to spread up and down the coasts of Peru and North and South America. Um, and so when that happens, you get problems for kelp. Okay, so this picture right here shows you um, typically where the warm water is over here by Australia and the Indo-Pacific. And then in El Nino, okay, all of that warm water comes back over here by Peru and stuff. Okay, and then spreads up the coast. Um, so we have kelp forests up here. When that warm water reaches us, um, the kelp forests suffer. Here's why. They like cold water. It brings warm water to them. Because it brings warm water, they're weakened. And that means that they're more likely to be uprooted by storms um, and more vulnerable to disease. Um, and so because they're weakened and they can be uprooted or die of disease, the distribution of kelp forests will actually decrease um, uh, in an El Nino year. And you may actually have some kelp forests that will switch to an urchin barren, if you remember, that's the alternative stable state. You'll also even have the makeup of the community of kelp forests change. So during El Nino, you get a lot of the warmer water southern fish that will come up um, into kelp forests. And then you'll in La Nina, you'll actually get some of the like colder water northern fish that, that come down and dominate. Normally, you get a combination of both, but uh, La Nina brings colder water down. Okay, we'll stop there.